to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. We're excited to have another episode with you today. Today, we're going to move along in our progression from what it means to be an officer to how you actually become one. So Reed and I are experts on officer training school, or OTS, and Air Force ROTC. Reed, you are a graduate of and a former instructor of officer training school. That's correct? Yes, that is correct. I graduated in April of 2011. Went back as an instructor in 2016, and I was there for two years. So would you say that you know something about how OTS should work? I certainly have my opinions, yes. But yes, having been there, been an instructor, and also was at the leadership there as a group executive officer, I got to see and understand what it meant to be at OTS a little bit more than your average instructor. And so that's why I'm hoping to share some valuable information with their audience. That's excellent. Yeah. And I've been in Air Force ROTC. Well, first of all, I was there as a cadet starting in 2006. I was a cadet for five years. I wanted to study mechanical engineering and the norm for those types of degrees is to take five years, despite what the university may tell you. So I graduated from Air Force ROTC in 2011, and I have been an instructor at Air Force ROTC for the last two years. So hopefully I know something as well about how Air Force ROTC works. Admittedly, though, my expertise is limited to my specific detachment, but I'll get into those types of details a little bit later. The point being is that you and I are experts on specifically OTS and Air Force ROTC. And so in this episode, we are going to focus our attention and the detail there. We would like to do another episode on the Air Force Academy at a later date. But in addition to our own personal experience, there are some practical reasons on why we would want to focus strictly on officer training school and Air Force ROTC for today. And one of those primary practical reasons is that the fiscal year 2019 through 2023 program guidance letter or PGL shows that over 80% of officers coming into the Air Force over the next five years will receive their commission through Air Force ROTC or OTS. Now, the program guidance letter, Reed, how familiar are you with that? Pretty familiar. Something that we had to adjust our training schedule to regularly. The PGL outlined exactly how many students in each of the various training squadrons we had to push through the program every year. And that meant we had to adjust how many staff we had trained and ready, what our resources looked like. We had to build an entire calendar year's worth of a schedule around that PGL. Bottom line, our mission at OTS was to meet the requirements of the PGL while upholding the standards required for commissioning officers. And where does the PGL come from? The PGL comes from Air Force Recruiting Command through Headquarters Air Force A1 or personnel. And then it's also approved by Congress that says, hey, Air Force, this is the number of bodies specifically enlisted and officer that you are allowed to have or that you need to target over the course of the next five years. And so this is a binding document. This is essentially an order from Congress and from headquarters, Air Force, down to the home center that owns and operates officer training school and Air Force ROTC. And again, it is what enables those two organizations, those two institutions to produce over 80% of the Air Force's officers. Yeah, I think that's a really good point that you bring up. Again, we are servants of the people of the United States, and we follow the laws and are subject to them. And that will come into play as we talk about the application process and the weighting that's involved. This is not a company or a business that can operate under you know, the free market and hire and fire as they wish. And that will drive a lot of the things and will explain kind of the background and context for 
some of the things that might seem strange as we go through them today. Yeah, and by contrast, the Air Force Academy is under the same guidance. You know, it follows the PGL, and the PGL limits the number of students that can go to the Air Force Academy to about a thousand new cadets each year. So that means that very few people who want to go to the Air Force Academy actually get the opportunity to go. Of the, you know, the 10 or 15,000 people who apply to go to the Air Force Academy each year, only about 10 or 15% are going to get in. And then even fewer than that will actually graduate and receive their commission from the Air Force Academy. So this doesn't discount the role of the United States Air Force Academy in producing officers for the Air Force. But the honest truth is that if you are listening to this podcast right now, you are probably too old to go there is number one. (laughs) But even if you're not too old, or if you know someone who is not too old to go to the Air Force Academy, the honest truth is, you know, for good or for bad, they're probably not going to get in. And so the likelihood of someone receiving a commission into the Air Force is going to be through Air Force ROTC or OTS. So Colin, are you telling me that my dreams of going to the academy that I shouldn't try? No. Well, you shouldn't try. (laughs) You specifically read. Okay. You should not try. Well said. (laughs) So if there is a sophomore or a junior or even a senior in high school right now, or even in some cases, someone who is already in college that has the dream of going to the Air Force Academy, by all means, try. Like I said, we will have an episode on how to apply to and get into the Air Force Academy at a later date. Just be real with your expectations. Be real about what the probabilities are that you are probably not going to get into the Air Force Academy. And even if you do, you might not graduate from there. Yeah. And I'll be honest, a little bit of that was a setup to kind of establish a little bit of a pecking order in the way the Air Force views its commissioning sources. They focus a lot of time and energy and money on selection for and developing their officers as they come out of the Air Force Academy, as they should. Second, the next biggest source is the Air Force ROTC program. And third is OTS. OTS is the flexible partner in this whole system. And that's a really important thing to understand as we go through what OTS is, how it works, how selection works, and also as I go through some of my hints, tips, and tricks. Well, great. Reed, we'll let you take it away from there. As the expert on Air Force Officer Training School and as that flexible partner, why don't you give us an explanation of what OTS is and how you get into it? Excellent. All right. So first and foremost, there is no way that I'm going to be able to describe in detail all of the various ways a person can go through the application process, the selection process, and actually end up at Officer Training School. I did a little bit of math. That's the nerd in me is coming out. And I counted at least 162 different ways, and there's probably more, different ways that you can get selected for officer training school. And just to give you an example of what we're dealing with here, there are a number of categories of people, number of categories of officers that are trained there. And then there are a variety of components, and we'll get through all of them. So first, you have civilian personnel. This is the route for civilian personnel who already have a college degree, who would like to join the Air Force as an officer. This is how that can happen. Sorry, Reed, can you explain to us what you mean by civilian? Civilian is a person who has not served in the U.S. Armed Services, Armed Forces in any capacity, and basically a normal average person. That's what I mean by civilian personnel. If you have some sort of prior military experience, you are going to be what's called a prior or a prior enlisted. There's a number of different versions, but if you've served in the Department of Defense under Title 10, wearing the uniform in some capacity, you're considered a different category of applicant. So again, primary source for civilians with a four-year degree who wish to join the Air Force as an officer. And then we have five additional categories of prior military service. And essentially, they're prior enlisted from all of the other services. So Army, Navy, Coast Guard, Marines, and prior Air Force enlisted. Those are the categories of people by and large that are able to apply. Then you have two main types of Air Force officers. And I'm sure we'll go into detail. Go ahead. So real quick, 
I don't have to have prior military experience to go to OTS. That is correct. That is correct. Although I would say, depending on the year, depending on the board, and we'll all go through that in a little bit, prior enlisted members do make up a significant portion of the students that attend officer training school. But no, you do not have to have a military experience to go to OTS. I imagine that makes for a really interesting training dynamic. It does. It does. It's very interesting and can be a challenge for an instructor, you know, who may have a lot less military experience than some of their students. Or it could be challenging to the civilian, as you said, that has no experience. Absolutely. It does prove to be a very dynamic situation, but one that is ripe with training opportunities. Excellent. All right. So we talked about the categories of people, right? You have civilians, and then you have all the variety of prior enlisted members. And then you have two different types of officers. There's two main types, what we call line of the Air Force. And then we have non-line officers. The Air Force and the Navy and the Marines, we have this division in our officer corps between line and non-line. Line officers or line of the Air Force are officers that will participate in combat-related duties and can command combat units or personnel that can conduct combat. Non-line officers are what we categorize largely as non-combatants or personnel that cannot command combatant troops. These are your dentists, doctors, lawyers, chaplains, nurses, medical corps, hospital admin, etc. For your line officers, this is your pilots, your intelligence, your engineers, your mechanics, etc. This is what we typically think of when we think of joining the military and the combat roles. That's what we call line of the Air Force. Now, there's even another subdivision within line of the Air Force selection criteria. We have two different categories of line of the Air Force. We have rated officers and we have non-rated officers. Rated officers are air crew flying. These are your pilots, your navigators, your electronic warfare officers, your combat systems officers, and your remotely piloted aircraft or RPA pilots. Then you have non-rated officers, and that's everybody else. Why are we going through all this, Colin? We're going through all of this because each of these people applying for these different jobs will go through a slightly different application and selection process. For line of the Air Force officers, there are two boards. There's a rated board. Again, this is your air crew, you're flying. And then you have a non-rated board. That's for everybody else. Line of the Air Force has a whole different selection process than non-line of the Air Force. And then under non-line officers, you've got dentists who go through a different process than doctors who go through a different process than lawyers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we are still not done. The hits keep coming. All right. <laughs> we're not done yet. <laughs> yeah, we're still not done with just a variety of people and how they can join. So the last three categories that we haven't talked about yet are the military components of the Air Force. You have the active duty component, you have the reserve component, and you have the guard component. All three of them, commission officers through OTS, and all three of them have a different selection process. So you multiply it all together, and you have a whole lot of different ways that you can get selected for OTS. And I haven't even started talking about some of the very special limited edition selection processes that come out of, you know, the chief of staff can select somebody to go to the academy. The chief of staff can select someone to go to OTS. There's a whole bunch of these enlisted programs in the Air Force that can get you there. Bottom line, there are a whole lot of ways to get selected to OTS, and I simply won't be able to go through them all. We'd be here, our entire podcast would be dedicated to the variety of ways, and that's not going to be beneficial to everybody. It sounds really complicated, Reed. It does, which is why, drum roll, this is the most important thing you need to know about how to get into OTS. You have to get in touch with a recruiter. So let's talk about that. What's your role, Colin, relative to... ROTC and recruiting versus OTS's role with being a recruiter? Because they're pretty different. Yeah, they're very different. At least the recruiting role within Air Force ROTC is to primarily provide information. On the OTS side of things, the recruiter actually like will process your paperwork that enables you to get in and you know, schedule you a training date. The recruiter for Air Force ROTC does not do that. I just tell you, hey, this is what the program is. You can get yourself in by registering for the classes and going to this website. 
And I'll get into the simplicities of Air Force ROTC in that way a little bit later. Perfect. Yeah, that's a really good segue back to OTS, which is anything but simple. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to outline some basic overarching principles that will cover the overwhelming majority of the students that I taught as an instructor. It will cover the basics for a civilian applicant and a little bit about prior enlisted applicants and Again, kind of the basics for mostly line officers, rated and non-rated. When it comes to the non-line officers, there's simply too many intricacies of, well, where are you relative to the completion of your specialized degree? What does Congress have to say right now? And the list goes on and on. So those are the majority of the students that I'll talk about today and just some key principles. So again, first thing we mentioned, you've got to get in touch with the recruiter. And these are actually recruiters whose entire job is to identify and assist with applicants in accomplishing what it is to fill out the application. It's very complicated. And another thing that you have to understand is through this process, you're going to require access to DOD facilities, to DOD personnel. And these are serious professionals with jobs to do. And so recruiters job is very much to screen potential applicants. We'll talk about that as we go on in some of the requirements as we go on later down the line. How do you find a recruiter? The best way to find a recruiter is go to airforce.com. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, there's a little link in little print that says find a recruiter. Click that link and it'll ask some really basic questions. Geographically, where are you? What is your level of education? And using that, it will give you a couple options. But it's very straightforward. It will give you the email address, the physical address, and a phone number of the recruiter in your area who's responsible for recruiting officers. And that is the best way for a civilian applicant to get in touch with a military recruiter that will help them through this process. For Air Force enlisted members, you're going to want to go to your base education office. And that is going to be how you're going to get it started with the process. So let's say, Reed, that I'm a civilian. You know, I know nothing about the Air Force, but I'm walking down Main Street in small town USA, and I see a sign that says Air Force on a building. And I walk in there, and I'm greeted by a recruiter. What's going to happen then? Very often, most of those stations are manned by Air Force recruiters, whose job it is to recruit enlisted members. And that is their mission. And just like the dedicated warriors and professionals they are, that is what they're going to try to recruit you to do. So if you are clear in your desire to be an officer, that person, one, if that recruiter is in that station, fantastic. They should just walk you over to their office and give you an opportunity to speak with them. But more likely, they're going to have one recruiter for a much larger geographic area. And you're going to have to be a little bit persistent to get that information and get that person's name. Because again, these recruiters are dedicated, hardworking professionals. And if someone's expressing interest and is qualified, they're going to try to get them to enlist in the Air Force. And I do want to mention, there is absolutely nothing wrong with enlisting in the Air Force. They are the backbone of our military profession. And I am grateful for them every day. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about how to commission. Right. So just want to make that point clear that if you just walk into a recruiting station, the one that's down the street from where you live, you're probably not going to end up talking to the recruiter who is in charge of getting you into OTS or officer training school. Exactly. When I was going through the recruiting process, the officer recruiter just happened to live about 10 minutes from my parents' house, but that recruiter was responsible for Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, Idaho, and parts of Nevada. Wow. That was the size of his geographic recruiting area. And it just so happened to be 10 minutes from my child and home. So more than likely, that is not going to be the situation for you. You're going to have to get in touch with someone. There's a variety of ways to do that. But the best way to find this person's name and information is to go to airforce.com and find a recruiter, put in some basic details, and it should point you in the right direction. But Reed, if I go onto airforce.com and put in those details, aren't I going to be constantly contacted and hounded by those other recruiters that want to enlist me? While I think that's possible, I find it highly unlikely. And that actually leads to one of the points that I have listed down here. 
when I was sitting in my recruiter's office going through the paperwork, you know, talking about some things, I was shocked at how often this person's phone was ringing. Depending on the situation, you know, geopolitical situation, on the economy, on any number of situations, there are a lot of people trying to get into the Air Force as an officer, and they are not going to hold your hand through this process. It's going to take a lot of time, and this is something, if you want it, you're going to have to go out and get it. No one cares about this nearly as much as you do. They're not going to hold your hand. They are not going to pester you and call you all the time. If you want to get this, you're going to have to go out and get it. It's of note, you know, virtually every single one of my students that I taught over my two years had gone through significant lengths, multiple applications, multiple boards, and had done a lot to get there. Some of them had sacrificed immensely. And I would put myself in that category. It took me 14 months just to get my selection notification and then another almost the same amount of time before I had a class date. Wow. So the Air Force is not going to hold your hand on this. You're going to have to go out and get it. So back to the list of broad overarching principles, you're going to have to get a recruiter. This is not something that you can just go to a website and fill out an application and all of a sudden you're going to be headhunted until they hire you. There are a lot of people that want to do this and you're going to have to go out and get it. The next thing I want to talk about is the amount of resources available to you. They're a little bit disparate. They're a little bit spread out, which is one of the reasons we're doing this podcast. But there are a lot of people who want to share. Find someone. Ask around. You may have a neighbor, a friend, or someone at church or at school who has served in the Air Force or has gone through this. They're a great resource to ask questions to. Get online. A couple of unofficial sources that I've found very useful, airforceots.com. Again, not an official source, but it was a great forum. It was online forums. Remember those, Colin, the online forums? Yes. Yeah. Are we dating ourselves by talking about online forums? Absolutely. Yeah. Back to you know, 1998. Yeah. But excellent resources, and they had a lot of valuable information. I understand now there are other groups on social media platforms that you can find information about. Very, very useful. So utilize your resources. Don't just go in cold and expect that they're going to spoon feed you all this stuff. These are serious professionals who have a real job to do and they take it seriously and they expect you to come prepared. What about us, Reed? Can people reach out to us to get help on applying to OTS? Absolutely. More than happy to help. As a matter of fact, throughout my career, especially after being an instructor, every time I've gone to a unit and people find out I've been an instructor there, they will find that enlisted member who was just selected and say, hey, would you like to talk to them about how they can be successful there? Or, hey, I've got someone who's interested in OTS. Can you help them through some things they should think about? More than happy to reach out to me at any time, and we can try to help you with the process. So how should somebody reach out to you, Reed? First, if you want to look for us unofficially, we've got links to our various social media platforms that we're engaged in. We're happy to engage with you there. But the best way to really get some ground truth is to reach out to me at my official Air Force email, which is reed.gan at us.af.mil. And we'll put some links down in the show notes. Great. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about that broadly applies no matter who the applicant is and what process they're going through is there's going to be a lot of paperwork. There's going to be a lot of time. Some of the paperwork that you're going to have to go through, you're going to answer a whole lot of questions about who you are, fill out a bunch of papers about medical screening. You're going to have to go to, many of you will have to go to a military entrance processing station or MEPS. This is a location where you are screened for your fitness. And by fitness, I mean, do you meet the physical requirements to be a member of the United States Air Force? You'll have to get letters of recommendation. You're going to have to certify that your degree is complete, et cetera. There's a whole lot of paperwork you're going to have to go through. Another thing you're going to have to do is take the Air Force Officer Qualifying Test or the AFOQT. I believe we've mentioned that in previous episodes. This is all going to take time. It's all going to take effort. And this is not something that you can just decide on a whim and two months before the board quickly run through everything that's going to be required. It's just simply not going to happen. You said earlier that this process of getting just to the notification of your selection was about 14 months. About how much of that time was devoted to just filling out the application and doing some of these administrative tasks? Easily about six months. It took about six months. 
it takes quite a bit of time. And that actually leads me perfectly into my next broad overarching statement. And that is when it comes to selection for officer training school, you need to have a plan B. What do I mean by that? Do I mean that you shouldn't strive for this? That's not what I'm saying. But like you kind of mentioned at the top, Colin, people need to have appropriate expectations. And officer training school is the flexible partner in the overall plan for producing officers to join the Air Force. What that means is if the Air Force is retaining a large number of officers for a variety of reasons, no one's getting out, no one's retiring, no medical disqualifications, we're not losing people due to combat, et cetera, then they need some way of slowing down the number of officers coming into the Air Force. It's very hard to go to someone who's at the Air Force Academy and say, I know you've done three years here, you've done great work, but we don't need you. That's just not going to happen. Same with someone who's put in three, four years at ROTC. That's significantly harder to do. However, you can stop commissioning at OTS. And so they can and have turned down the spigot, if you will, and really slow down the number of people that come into OTS. So if you want to commission and you're serious about it, you need to think about some of these longer term ways that are a little bit more direct and to get in because you never know what could happen. I tried to join the Air Force in 2009 is when I really started. 2008, 2009 is when I really started my application process. Colin, what was happening in the world in 2008, 2009? Man, we were reeling from a huge financial meltdown. We were. And as a result, people that had been previously employed and were no longer employed were looking for other options. And one other option that they look to is the military. In addition, if I'm in the military and I have a steady job and the money is coming in, how likely am I to get out and try to go find something else? Not very likely at all. Not likely. All of that rolled up into a very low selection rate. They canceled a number of the selection boards that they have. Normally, there's about four a year for line of the Air Force. They canceled two of them. They only held two boards that year. And in my selection letter, which we'll put links in the show notes to, so you can see that link from Air Force Recruiting Services, there were 1,139 applicants. They selected 114 people. And of those 114, 42 of them were prior enlisted. So why am I telling you this? I'm not telling you this to make me sound like some amazing person. I'm telling you this because you need to have a plan B. If Air Force is your plan A, off the way to get there via OTS should probably be down the ladder a few steps just due to the way it has to function as that flexible commissioning partner. Yeah, I mean, you're describing OTS as having a selection rate similar to that of the Air Force Academy. Exactly. 10 to 15%. Exactly. It was very tight at that time. Now, fast forward to 2015, 2016, 2017, when I'm there as an instructor, we have a change in administration. We have an increase in the total number of members of our branch as dictated by Congress. And we are having classes three and four times the size of the class that I went through. I can't predict that. You can't predict that. If you can, I've got a job for you. I'd love to have you on my team. But the <laughs> bottom line is OTS is hard for that to be your plan A. And I hope we've conveyed that. The last thing, my big tip, and we've kind of hinted at it already, you're likely to wait a very long time. This can take a significant period for you to get selected. I had students who had waited more than a year after their selection to actually get a class date. Then they waited an additional eight months or more to actually report for training. So depending on the situation, it can take a long time. So what do you do in the meantime? Everything and anything. If you're enlisted, you will continue to stay in your job. It can limit the places and situations that they could PCS you. They may not allow you to PCS due to different requirements. PCS, I should explain that. Could you uh, explain what a PCS is, Colin? Yeah, for sure. PCS, permanent change of station, if you are enlisted or an officer even on active duty, a PCS or a permanent change of station is when they move your duty assigned location to another base or another physical location. You are permanently changing your status, your assignment to another place, as opposed to a TDY or temporary duty yonder, 
which is a temporary assignment change where your permanent assignment remains the same. Perfect, thanks. So yeah, if you are enlisted and you are selected for OTS, that may limit your opportunity to move. They often want you to be able to be in a new location for a certain amount of time before they want you to leave that location. So a lot of things go into that, but bottom line, this is not a quick process. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some planning. I know a number of members, students that I trained, that this was part of a five to 10 year plan for them. You know, they enlisted young, they were most of the way through a degree or not. That was the plan. I want to be an officer. And they tried the ROTC way that didn't quite work out or whatever. But most of these students that I had almost overwhelmingly, this was not something that they just did on a whim. It was part of a much larger plan that they had. And that's probably best how to approach OTS. And one thing I think we should add there is that your plan A, which is going through OTS, and your plan B are likely going to happen simultaneously. That while you are working your plan A, you are also working your plan B, as in you're going to have a job in your plan B while you are working your plan A, meaning you have an employer in your plan B that you have to manage expectations with, explaining to them that you have this goal or that you have been accepted and you're anticipating a training date to leave that employment office and go to the Air Force. And that can have some significant impacts on your job opportunities, your promotions, those kinds of things. So again, want you to manage your expectations on what it takes, what the sacrifices may be in order to achieve this goal of becoming an officer in the Air Force, at least through OTS. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say that as I mentioned earlier, almost all of my students had gone through some pretty significant challenges to get there. It made it overwhelmingly a positive experience from an instructor's perspective, because I knew that my students really wanted to be there, and they had proven that by the lengths they had gone to earn their selection. I'm sure we'll talk about that later, but that pretty much covers it from OTS. If you have any specific questions, please feel free to hit us up on the social medias, on the internets, or to email me. We're happy to answer those questions and to try to help you out. Awesome. Thanks, Reed. You bet. That's a, that's a great overview of Officer Training School or OTS. Awesome. Thanks for joining us and listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.